Sorry, do this. All right, cool. So it's going to be recording on the screen. Um, sometimes I'm going to switch back and forth between the exam as well, just to make sure that I cover all the things that you guys need to know. But um, other than that, I'm going to be recording this. Um, and then I'll have the rest of the students view it on YouTube. Do you sessions only affirm that you still know nothing or that you know everything you're supposed to know? What he said. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> All right. So the very first thing I want to go over with you guys was the whole entire uh, uh, pulmonary function test. Okay. So with the pulmonary function test, I'm just going to draw it out and you guys can fill in the blanks. Let me know what you guys know. Okay. So. Uh, is that good? I'll make sure that you can see the, the recording. And I also want to make sure I can see what I'm actually drawing over here. So let's do the X and Y axis here. Okay. So the very first thing will be just what we're all doing right now. Okay. None of us are super nervous. So we're all just kind of doing this, right? And all of a sudden, if we go... Deep breath in, then you exhale everything completely out, and then you go back to your normal, just chilling, what we're all doing right now, okay? Cool. What's this volume called right here? No. Tidal volume. Tidal volume, good. Tidal volume. Let's say the tidal volume is 500, okay? So tidal volume 500, that's going to be normal for both males and females. That's going to be pretty pretty normal across the board. Some people might have less, some people might have more, depending on the person's size, right? Whether or not they have any sort of like respiratory illness as well. A person with pulmonary fibrosis, their tidal volume might be reduced because of that if they have like a restrictive type lung disease. Well, tidal volume is just inhaling and exhaling. Just, re just all of us sitting here, exhaling, inhaling, just not thinking about it, nothing crazy going on, right? You're not exercising, you're just at rest, okay? So what's this value over here where you took that deep breath in? What's that called? Inspiratory reserve. Good. IRV, inspiratory reserve volume. Let's just pretend that it's 1,500. Okay. These are just arbitrary numbers I'm pulling out of a hat here. So the IRV, let's say it's... Uh, 1500 what's this value down below that's when you blew everything out expiratory what good erv let's say that value is 1000 just for the sake of simplicity okay what's going to be this volume down over here is it residual volume mm -hmm. cool good let's say the residual volume is 500 all right, now what would be this right here? What would that uh, what would that value be? Yeah, so that's vital capacity. So let's go ahead and calculate that. What's the vital capacity? Let's do the math. So we have inspiratory reserve volume of fifteen hundred. Okay, tidal volume five hundred. So you got two thousand. And then expiratory reserve volume was 1,000. So what's the vital capacity? 3,000. 3, Excellent. No, no, no. You just added. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so vital capacity is 3,000. We know that the reserve, uh, or sorry, the residual volume is 500. So what would this value be called where you include the residual volume? Total lung capacity. So what would that be for this patient or this individual? 3,500. Good. So 3,500, awesome. Now let's change colors here. Let me do, let me do red. So the vital capacity is without the residual volume? Yeah, exactly, yep. Vital capacity is what you're breathing, like the most amount that you're able to breathe out and the most amount that you're able to breathe in, okay? That entire amount of air is gonna be your vital capacity, but there's always gonna be the residual volume, mm -hmm. right? You wanna make sure that you maintain your alveoli. Right. You want to make sure that they remain expanded. So there's always going to be a little bit of air left over so that those don't collapse. If you ran, if you, if those were to collapse, like sometimes a person, you know, might get like a pneumothorax, for instance, mm -hmm. it's really hard to like re expand those alveoli. Oh. Right. And so you can't reinflate the lung. 
well, pneumothorax, you got a lot more going on as well. Speaking of pneumothorax, what's a pneumothorax look like on an x-ray? Do you guys remember? All white. It would be all black. All white. Yeah, because black would be air. If something is white, that means it's like harder, right? So bone on an x-ray looks white, right? So it's more solid type items are going to be uh, whiter in, its, in their color. If it's completely dark, that means there's nothing there. So if someone's lung looks completely dark, don't think, oh, that looks really great. <laughs> you have nothing going on there. It's like, yeah, actually their lung has completely collapsed. And then you also have a shifting of the mediastinum to the opposing side. So you guys remember what the mediastinum is, right? So what is it? What's the mediastinum? It's gonna be heart, okay? heart and all the major vessels. So your aorta, pulmonary trunk, et cetera. If you see complete black emptiness, right? And then you see the mediastinum shifting over to the opposite side. That means a lot of air now is all of a sudden within that thoracic chamber, right? And so what, uh, what, air, what area would that be considered? What's that, what's that space? <clears throat> plural space? Yeah, so that'd be within the plural space. Dead space, I just thought of the dead space part. <laughs> oh yeah, no, not dead space. No, that's, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So anyway, sorry, that was a major digression. Just know what a pulmonary, uh, know what a pneumothorax looks like on x-ray. That's going to be really important. And know where the air is. It's going to be within that plural space. So you said, um... So once it's black, that means it's air. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's got air in it. So you can also get like hemothorax, where it would be filled with fluid, right? It'd be full, full of blood. Um, so yep. Yep. So know what uh, what what those will look like on x-rays. So the hemothorax would be black as well. Um, that's a good question. It would be more it would be more opaque. Uh, because you would see uh, there would be fluids, right? And the fluids would come across as a little bit more solid. If it's air, it's just going to be completely black, completely empty. All right, so now we got total lung capacity. We got the vital capacity. Now I changed the color here. So what is this value over? Whoop, not that. Go away. What's this value over here? Ah, why did I disappear? Let me try that again. There we go. What's that value right there? So it's involving both the tidal volume as well as the inspiratory reserve volume. What's that called? So yeah, that'd be inspiratory capacity. So inspiratory capacity or just IC. So calculate the inspiratory capacity. What's the value? Yeah, exactly. So 2000, perfect. Okay, then what is this value over here? Mm -hmm. Expiratory. Expiratory what? Capacity. Good. So capacities, when you hear the term capacity, you're thinking a combination of different values, right? So inspiratory capacity, you're combining inspiratory reserve volume plus the tidal volume. Expiratory capacity, you're combining expiratory reserve volume plus the uh, residual volume. And so for this one, that would be what? 1500, right? Mm -hmm. So when you hear capacities, you're going to be adding up different values, all right? Where like the margins they stop at, that's what like what you add. Um, I mean, you'd be adding everything, so you'd be adding the expiratory reserve volume plus the residual volume, right? And so whenever you see like vital capacity, you're getting three different values. You're adding together, you're adding inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume plus the expiratory res uh, reserve volume. Uh, total lung capacity. You're adding every single one of those uh, values together. Okay. So do you guys get that pretty, is it pretty straightforward? All right. Just, it seems like a lot of you guys have a, a pretty decent grip on the pulmonary function test, which is awesome. So as, as long as you, you understand how to calculate for those different values, you'd be good on that. Any questions on the, on the pulmonary function test? No? Cool. What would happen if, um, what would happen if you had destruction of the elastic tissues within your alveoli? Would that result in like restrictive or obstructive uh, disease? Obstructive disease. What's going on with obstructive disease? Do you guys remember? 
take events into um, I think it's more like breathing properly. Or right. It helps. It prevents them from breathing properly. <laughs> Both obstructive and restrictive disease does that. Yes. Yeah, they have a hard time. So you get air trapping. So air gets trapped into the lungs. You're not able to get air out. And so like, for instance, the patient with like COPD, for example, they're going to have, uh, you know, barrel chest. They're going to have air trapping. They might also have pursing of their lips. Remember when I was telling you guys about that, you'll have like a patient like they'll purse their lips. So it helps them exhale all the air out, but it's very slow exhalation. What's up? Yeah, so like the elastic tissues within the alveoli. If you had destruction of the elastic tissues within the alveoli, you would have emphysema, okay? So know that that's gonna be the association with emphysema. Now, what's the opposite of obstructive? That's restrictive, right? What's the example of restrictive? Asthma is actually considered an obstructive. Yeah, so obesity is one also. Remember the other one? Mm -mm. Pulmonary fibrosis. Good. Exactly. So what's going on with restrictive lung disease? Yeah, you have a hard time expanding uh, your lungs, right? So you have a harder time inflating your lungs. So you're getting a lot less, uh, a lot less air into your lungs to begin with. What's going on with your forced expiratory volume in one second in both of those? First of all, what's the forest expiratory value in one second? You guys remember? It's how much air you can blow out within one second by force, right? So uh, for a person who has um, obstructive lung disease, do you think they're going to be able to blow out a lot of air within one second? No, it's going to be pretty much um, pretty reduced. It's below like 70%, okay? Um, same thing with restrictive lung disease. What's going on with restrictive lung disease? Why do they have a reduced amount of air that they're blowing out in one second? Yeah, they don't have enough air in their lungs to begin with. So when they blow out in one second, it's like like a they imagine like a really really like tight balloon, right? So as soon as you let it go, it's gonna like let all the air out really rapidly because it's you get uh, you know it's kind of like how you think about like pulmonary fibrosis. So it's I think about being like almost hyperelastic. It's kind of one way to conceptualize it. It's not not entirely correct, but it's one way to think about it. After the obstruction of elastic tissue in the alveoli, is you have a trouble exhaling, right? Yeah, you have trouble exhaling. So you get air trapping. So in other words, your lungs are going to be well, especially for COPD, the lungs are going to be hyperinflated. And what did you say? What COPD? Was? Yeah, COPD and emphysema. So with COPD, you have hyperinflation of the alveoli. In um, emphysema, you have destruction of the elastic tissues that allow for rebound of the alveoli. What's wrong with the tissues with restrictive lung disease? Uh, restrictive, well, with obesity, it's just you have so much weight on the lungs, it's harder to inflate them. With pulmonary fibrosis, you get like a lot of fibrotic type tissues, so it's not going to be as elastic, so it can't really expand properly. So you have less air being able to enter into the, into the lungs to begin with. So let's talk about um, the uh, hemoglobin saturation uh, chart. So this is another one that's going to be really important for you guys. Ah. There we go. All right. So let me make sure I got a good color here. Let's do black. So again, we'll do uh, another X and Y axis. Okay. So what's the what's going to be here on the left? Huh? Yeah, so that's going to be the hemoglobin, right? So HB. So this is hemoglobin percent saturation, okay? So let's do on the top here 100. And then let's do another one right in the middle for 50. So that'd be 50% saturation. What's the value on the um, x-axis? What are we looking at here? Partial pressure, which is measured in what? millimeters of mercury and we're looking at the partial pressure of oxygen okay and again we're going to go all the way to 100 over here and then i'm going to put a little line here for 
roughly, let's say roughly 20% or roughly 20 millimeters of mercury, okay? So what's going on with the oxygen saturation curve? It's not, a, it's not straight, right? It's gonna be, it's gonna be sort of like a weird kind of like curve. Uh, let's just go ahead and just draw it out. So you get really close to 100. But as the uh, fellow in that video that I played for you guys talked about, you're never going to quite get to 100. Why is that? Right, exactly. So in other words, the conducting regions of the lungs are also going to need oxygen. And so you have blood going to those areas, right? In those areas, you're not going to get ventilation, right? Because those are the conducting regions. What's that? What's the other term for the conducting regions? Remember dead space? <laughs> so that's, that's going to be like the dead space, okay? So you get like a little bit percentage of blood that's going to be uh, uh, perfusing those regions. And so they're not going to get oxygenated. So you're thinking maybe around like 97-ish percent, okay? But just for the sake of simplicity, pretend it's all the way to 100. But in reality, you're not going to fully get to 100. So what's going on over here in terms of What's, why did I highlight 20 over here? What's going on with 20? 20 millimeters of mercury in terms of your partial pressure of oxygen. Yeah, so even if you're in a room that only had 20 millimeters of mercury partial pressure of oxygen, 50% of your hemoglobin are still gonna get oxygenated, right? They're still gonna be saturated. That means half of all your hemoglobin is gonna, is gonna be saturated, even if you're at a really low uh, partial pressure of oxygen. Why is that? Has to do with binding affinity of oxygen. What's going on with the binding affinity of oxygen and hemoglobin? Mm -hmm. Right? Exactly. So you add like one molecule of oxygen, all of a sudden that increases the binding affinity to hemoglobin. You keep on adding more oxygen, you get higher and higher binding affinity. Is this like one hemoglobin or one blood cell? It's within, you know, how it's like, it has like these four little subunits, mm -hmm. right? You have like the two alpha and the two beta subunits. As you add oxygen to each of those subunits, then the other uh, subunits have a higher and higher affinity for oxygen. <clears throat> so that's going on over here at 50 percent saturation, sorry, 50, yeah, you got 50% saturation of hemoglobin, even if you're down at like around 20 something millimeters of mercury partial pressure of oxygen. So that's important to keep in mind here. So let me go ahead and change colors. So um, what are the things that are going to uh, shift to the left on this oxygen hemoglobin curve? What are the, the factors that help to shift to the left? Decrease temperature. Did you say decrease in temperature? Mm -hmm. Good. So you have decreased temperature. What else? Alkalosis. Alkalosis. Good. Alkalosis, aka increase in pH. So at that, uh, with those two variables, you're going to get a shifting to the left. Could you repeat those? So uh, decreased temperature, increased pH, or alkalosis. You're going to get a shift to the left on that curve. So now we're still looking at 20 millimeters of mercury, bless you, 20 millimeters of mercury, partial pressure of oxygen. Now what's going on over here with this, with the hemoglobin saturation curve? It's gonna increase so the saturation. The partial oxygen be less? Well, let's just stick to 20 for now because it's that's kind of a good reference point because 20 under normal circumstances where you're just like sitting here hanging out, at 20, you would, you would get about 50% saturation of your hemoglobin. Okay, so let's just stick to 20 millimeters of mercury for oxygen. So at 20 millimeters of mercury of oxygen, now your saturation of hemoglobin is way higher. So let's just say for the sake of simplicity, 75% of your hemoglobin at that point is gonna be saturated. So in other words, you have a lot more hemo um, hemoglobin being bound to oxygen, right? So your oxygen saturation is way higher. Okay, so that's with decreased temperature and increased pH. Under what circumstances in real life would you have a decrease in your temperature? Hypothermia, Hypothermia good. So if you're if you're hiking in the Arctic, like my silly little example for God knows what re God knows why you'd be hiking in the Arctic, but if you were hiking in the Arctic and you got trapped out there, 
then you're going to have a really hard time for your hemoglobin to release oxygen into your tissues. Okay, so you're going to have a hard time oxygenating your tissues. Um, under what circumstances would you see an increase in your pH level? We're talking respiratory physiology. Let's think about respiratory reasons. Hyperventilation. Hyperventilation, good. So if you're breathing really rapidly, you're expelling your carbon dioxide more rapidly, what's gonna to happen to your pH? It's gonna go up, right? Because carbon dioxide is gonna be associated with acidity, right? The more carbon dioxide you have, the more acidic you are, the less carbon dioxide you have, the more um, alkaline you become, okay? So that's gonna be with increase in pH, decrease in temperature, all right? And then let's talk about uh, shifting to the right. What's going on with shifting to the right? Decrease temperature. Good, so you increase your temperature, you decrease your pH, then you have a shifting to the right. Okay, drawing the curve out. Now look at where you are at 20 millimeters of mercury partial pressure of oxygen. Now you're, I drew this kind of wonky, so it looks like it's more closer to like 40. So you have 40% of your hemoglobin is now going to be saturated at that low millimeter of mercury partial pressure for oxygen. So that means you're having more oxygen getting dumped off from your hemoglobin into your tissues. So when would you get increased temperature, decreased pH under normal circumstances, like a healthy individual? Exercise. Yeah, good, exactly. Someone just exercising, you're going on a jog, right? You're at the gym working out. Um, and that's important because the tissues that are gonna have a higher metabolic demand are gonna have more, they're going to be more acidotic, right? Due to like lactic acidosis, um, they're going to have increase in temperature and just due to increased metabolic activity, right? So those, those tissues are especially going to get more oxygen because hemoglobin is going to dump the oxygen off at those, um, at those cells. Okay. So what would be the abnormal circumstances by which you would see the increase in temperature as well as a decrease in pH? So increase in temperature where you know, yesterday I saw a lot of people wearing like summer clothes. We're getting pretty close to summer here in Arizona, right? So if, say you're hiking, I don't know, you're hiking Camelback <laughs> in June and it's like 120 degrees outside. You shouldn't be hi hiking Camelback in June, but if you were and you ran out of water, right? Now all of a sudden you become hyperthermic. You might be starting to get heat, stro heat stroke. So that would be one condition. You get hyperthermia. When you're hyperthermic, what's happening? to the oxygen on the hemoglobin. Oxygen is getting dumped off like everywhere, right? And just willy nilly, even tissues that don't necessarily have a high demand for oxygen, oxygen is gonna be released in those tissues anyways. Okay, what about- what's, that means your hemoglobin is higher than the oxygen or? No, your hemoglobin is gonna be a fixed number, right? You have a fixed number of hemoglobin, depending on how many red blood cells you have in your body. So the hemoglobin doesn't change. It's the oxygen saturation on hemoglobin. So it's going to be the oxyhemoglobin, right? Because we have oxyhemoglobin with oxygen and then it's deoxyhemoglobin without oxygen. So the so if you wanted to be more specific, yes. So your oxyhemoglobin would go down, your deoxyhemoglobin would go up. The overall quantity of like just hemoglobin itself doesn't change. That remains that remains the same. That's a fixed number. Um with pH levels, what kind of things would re result in a reduced pH in terms of like, you know, something pathological? So reduction in pH, that means you're acidotic. Let's continue thinking about respiratory. What's my favorite example of somebody who undergoes respiratory depression? Yeah, somebody is over overdosing on opioids, right? They start breathing really slowly, right? That's what kills the person when they're overdosing on opioids. If you're breathing really slowly, what happens to your carbon dioxide levels? Goes up, right? You become hypercapnic, okay? So that's with hypercapnia, then you're gonna see a reduction in your pH levels. So that's gonna cause a shifting to the right as well. What's another good example? We talked about obstructive, we talked about obstructive lung disease. What's one of the examples that I talked about with obstructive lung disease? Not COPD, not uh, emphysema. What's the other one? What's the third one? Asthma. asthma, good. So somebody's having an asthma attack, 
right? They're having a really hard time getting air down into their lungs, right? Because they have like bronchoconstriction, they might have like mucus plugs, things like that. And so they're also going to start becoming acidotic as well. Is Dr. Premack harassing you guys out there? <laughs> Feel free to shoot spitballs at him. <laughs> so are we good on, on the oxygen, uh, the hemoglobin uh, saturation curve? Pretty straightforward stuff. If you understand the physiology of, of it under normal circumstances, like exercise, right? If you're exercising, increase temperature, uh, decrease pH, right? If you're at rest, you're going to have increased uh, pH, decrease in temperature. Then you should understand this. This is like in normal circumstances, this is a way for your body to be able to meet the uh, metabolic demands of tissues that have uh, the need for oxygen, right? So that's that's the normal way to look at this, but you can also apply this to any sort of like patho pathological conditions as well. So that's that. What's, um, let's talk about 2,3 uh, BPG. Tell me about 2,3 BPG. What does 2,3 BPG do? Stabilize the T state, which is the, is it oxyhemoglobin or is it deoxyhemoglobin? Deoxyhemoglobin, awesome. So with deoxyhemoglobin, you'd be stabilizing the T state. So where would that be on this? Would it be a shift to the left or a shift to the right? What's the T state? Is it oxygenated or deoxygenated? It's deoxygenated, awesome. So that would be a shift to the what? Shift to the right or shift to the left? A shift to the right, good. So 2,3-BPG would facilitate the ability for hemoglobin to shift to the right in terms of its oxygen saturation. Okay, so that would be another thing that would help facilitate that. Okay, um, 2,3-BPG, does that uh, bind to fetal hemoglobin? No, why? Why do you want fetal hemoglobin to not bind to 2,3-BPG? Yeah, also where are they getting their oxygen from? Mom, right, through the placenta, right? So the oxygen needs to be basically transferred from mom's hemoglobin to child's hemoglobin, right? And in order to do that, you have to have an increased binding affinity for oxygen. So that's why fetal hemoglobin is gonna not bind to 2,3-BPG. And that can be used practically for you know patients who are undergoing sickle cell crisis, right? If you're having a sickling crisis, um, sometimes they'll administer fetal hemoglobin to those patients in order to help them increase their oxygen saturation. Let me think of what else here that what you guys need to know. Let me just uh, do a little cheat. I'm going to cheat real quick. All right, let's talk about some of the different laws. What were the different laws that we talked about in class? So what is Boyle's law? What does Boyle's law do? Exactly. Right. So let's talk about breathing. Let's talk about Boyle's law and how that applies to um, how that applies to respiratory physiology. So what's going on at uh, what's one ATM? What does that mean? That's one atmospheric pressure. What's atmospheric pressure at? What's going on here? Go away. Let me try to clear this out here real quick. Uh, erase all. There we go. Okay, so atmospheric pressure is so one atm is equal to seven hundred and sixty millimeters of mercury. Cool. So, um, how do you uh how do you breathe in? What's going on with your diaphragm? So your diaphragm is contracting or relaxing. So let's draw your lungs real quick. This is your thoracic cavity. So your diaphragm is going to be, dang it, I lost my pen, sorry. Your diaphragm is going to contract. Let me draw it also in a different color where it normally sits at. So pretend it kind of sits like this. It's gonna be sort of like a concave shape. All right, that's where it normally is. But when you're breathing in, your diaphragm is going to contract. What's going to happen to the overall volume within your lungs? Huh? Volume goes up, right? What's going to happen to the pressure? Pressure goes down. So that's Boyle's law. 
Cool. So increased in, increase in volume, you're decreasing the pressure. That's Boyle's law. So where is the air going to be? Uh, so I, let's let's give this a value in terms of millimeters of mercury. So you know one atmospheric pressure when you're at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury. What would be the millimeters of mercury within the thoracic cavity at this point? Just give me a number. Is it below or above 760? Yeah, exactly. So let's just say that's like 750, okay? So at 750 millimeters of mercury, you have the inter uh, alveolar pressure is going to be less than your atmospheric pressure. So what's going to happen to air? Yeah, exactly. Air gets pushed into the lungs. Perfect. So you have air now coming into the lungs. That kind of looks like a, a gravestone. <laughs> so let's do the opposite now where you have relaxation of the diaphragm now goes back up to its normal resting state. What's going to happen to the volume? Yeah. Volumes decrease, pressure is what? Increased, right? And now because of that, say your pressure within your uh, in, uh, in your interalveolar pressure, let's say it's above atmospheric pressure, right? So let's just pretend that it's 770 millimeters of mercury. So now air gets pushed out. So that's how Boyle's law works. That's Boyle's law simplified. So in terms of muscles for respiration, what are the important muscles? We talked about the diaphragm that accounts for what percentage of your respiration? About 70%, yeah. What are some of the muscles that are involved in um, inspiration? External, External intercostal muscles would be... Yeah, so that would be, so the inspiration, you're thinking external intercostals, they help to expand the thoracic cavity. So maybe think of them as being outside, it kind of helps them push them out. And then for expiration, internal intercostals. And then what are some of the other ones that we talked about? Huh? Well, diaphragm for sure, because the diaphragm is gonna be relaxing, right? And so accessory muscles. Yeah, so you got your serratus anterior muscles, you got your you got your rectus abdominis muscle, right? Mm -hmm. Those are all going to help to like push air out. Okay, so those are going to be some of the other muscles involved in expiration. Um, what are some of the other laws that we talked about? So you, you mentioned Henry's law. What's going on with Henry's law? Dissolving. Yeah, gas dissolves in the liquid. So if you use a um, what do you call it? Uh, airstream? Not an airstream. What the heck is that thing called? Where you like carbonate your water? Soda stream. soda stream yeah yeah airstream is the the camper <laughs> uh so not an airstream a soda stream if you're using a soda stream then you're you know you're carbonating your you're force carbonating your water right why was that uh important when we talked about uh nitrogen versus oxygen versus carbon dioxide is carbon dioxide um easy easily uh what is it what would be the term dissolved into solution in water Carbon dioxide actually is. It's actually pretty easily uh, uh, dissolved in solution in water. Okay. Isn't that when you gave us like the soda example? Yeah. So carbon dioxide is it's pretty easy. Uh, what about nitrogen? Does nitrogen want to stay in solution or does it want to come out of solution? Yeah, exactly. So nitrogen gas really wants to come out of solution. The reason why that's important, why is that? What was, huh? Yeah, the bends. So decompression sickness. Right. So when you're underwater, right, your atmospheric pressures go up significantly as you go underwater. And then if you're underwater for a long period of time, the nitrogen gets compressed, right, because of Henry's law. So now it's within solution within your blood. Now, as you if you go up too fast, if you rise up in elevation out of the water too fast, then all of a sudden the nitrogen doesn't have time to slowly come out of solution. It comes out of solution much more rapidly. And all of a sudden you have nitrogen gas getting trapped into different areas in your body. So that was like the, the practical application of Henry's law. What was the other law that we talked about? Yeah, Dalton's law. What's going on with Dalton's law? Pretty straightforward. Nothing crazy there. Yeah, each of the partial pressures of the different gases, as you add them all up, is going to add up to the total partial pressure of the air. Can we know the composition of air? Uh, no, don't worry about that. Just know that nitrogen, I mean, it's good to know that nitrogen is one of the major components of air. Oxygen is quite a bit less, but yeah.
Carbon dioxide is way less than oxygen. What about, um, speaking of carbon dioxide, what's, uh, what's that one law that we talked about or the effect that we talked about when you have carbon dioxide plus, um, plus water and you get something happening over there? Let me make sure I spell this correctly because my spelling sucks. You guys remember that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's the Bohr effect. And I would have spelled that correctly anyways, but I don't really get this thing up here. Erase all. So what's going on with uh, carbon dioxide? What's happening with carbon dioxide? Let's draw, let's draw a red blood cell. Probably should have drew it in red, but whatever. So what's going on with carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide, what's the what's the form in which carbon dioxide is mostly going to be transported within the blood? Carbonic acid. Good. So that's what? H2. C. Ah, dang it. We need to know like the carbonic acid. Yeah, uh, you need to for sure. Uh, the equation, well, what, how you write it out, H two CO three. It's good to know. H two CO three. Oh, I so, like the like really long. I don't know. Isn't it hard? The really long one. Which one was that? It was like nine digits. Nine digits. Where? I don't know. I saw it in the PowerPoint. I, I'm not sure what you're referring to. You're talking about carbonic acid? Going from carbon dioxide to carbonic acid and into bicarb? Is that what you're talking about? I don't know. It looks like one of those and then like equals and like another little section. And then like yeah, where it kind of goes. So that's all, all part of the Bohr's effect. So once you have carbon dioxide plus water turning into bicarb, uh, sorry, uh, carbonic acid, then it's going to freely disassociate into uh, protons plus bicarb. So that's a... Uh... All right, so that's the Bohr's effect. You have it going back and forth, okay? So it freely goes. And what's the enzyme that, that allows for carbon dioxide to turn into um, carbonic acid? You guys remember that? Carbonic anhydrase, good. So CA, carbonic anhydrase. So that's what allows uh, you to be able to go between the two. Um, now, what's going to be happening with uh, what's going to be happening with bicarb? Does bicarb get exchanged for anything? Huh? Yeah, good. Exactly. So you get exchange um, of bicarb for chloride ions. Okay, so you get a switching, you get a swapping of the two. And that that basically just helps, you know, buffer the blood. So it helps to kind of maintain the pH balance within the blood. Um, so in terms of carbonic uh, acid, in terms of percentage, what's the percentage of carbonic acid? Okay, good, 70%. What about carbon dioxide that's hanging out in the red blood cell bound to hemoglobin? like 23%-ish. 70% is gonna be carbonic acid, 23% 20 is gonna be carbon dioxide bound to hemoglobin. Where is it bound to on the hemoglobin? Is it bound to the iron, the Fe? No, it's bound to what? Yeah, free nitrogen, the free nitrogen group. And then um, where else do you find carbon dioxide? Yeah, it's going to be kind of hanging out in the plasma. You have carbon dioxide hanging out outside of the plasma. So it's going to be 7%, roughly speaking. So that's all going to be the Bohr effect. So B-O-H-R. All right. Do you only breathe out 23% of carbon dioxide? No, 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 no. This is the this is the form through which carbon dioxide gets transported throughout your blood. Do you breathe all of it out? All of it, yeah. So why does it get transported if it's just going to go back to carbon dioxide? What do you mean? Great. <laughs> it's a party. You want to join us? You breathe, out the... you breathe off the carbon dioxide. 
No, 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 because the carbonic acid would would change back into its carbon dioxide form. So carbon dioxide and water. What's the point of the change in the carbonic acid? Carbonic. I don't know what the point of it is. It's just that's the physiology. That's just the physiology of it. Yeah, that's just the way. That's just the way in which it's transported. Good question. I don't know why. You know, because. <laughs> the proton and then H. Ah, yeah. So the uh, bicarb is going to be swapped out for chloride ions. And that's basically just helping to uh, adjust the pH levels. So this is all going to be happening randomly to help balance out the pH levels of the blood. Because the blood, when you think about blood, think about it as also being a buffer type solution. When we talk about a buffer solution, buffers are basically just helping to maintain a pH balance. Right. So you don't want it to become like over the top, like acidotic or or alkalotic. Right. You want to kind of maintain the balance. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to undergo normal uh, physiological, you know, metabolic activities. So great question, though. Why is it in carbonic acid? I don't freaking know. <laughs> so just know the just know the percentages. OK. So that's one major thing to keep in mind. So let me look at my cheat sheet here and see if there's anything else we need to talk about for that. All right. Um, what is going on with uh, the cells within your lungs? What are the major cells within your lungs? Yeah, so you got type one and two pneumocytes. What's going on with type one pneumocytes? They, yeah, so what were they like? What kind of uh, cells? Yeah, good. They're squamous cells. So squamous cells, super thin. And because air, right? So carbon dioxide as well as oxygen are both going to be lipid soluble, right? They're going to be able to freely diffuse across that squamous cell epithelial layer. Okay. What about the type 2 pneumocytes? Pretty surfactant. Um, what's going on with new neonates, neonates that were born prematurely? They need to be given exogenous surfactant because otherwise their lungs start to collapse, right? In other words, their alveoli, as they breathe out, the alveoli collapse. It's basically impossible for them to reinflate those alveoli on their own. So they have to be given exogenous surfactant. To... Surfactant lowers surface tension? Yep, exactly. So it lowers the surface tension. It's kind of it kind of acts as if uh, you think about like a detergent, right? So uh, remember that video I was showing you where you where they were adding the water onto the penny, <laughs> and then so you saw that because of surface tension, it forms kind of like a by uh, a convex shape. As soon as you add detergent or soap or anything like that, that breaks apart that surface tension, and now the water just freely flows, right? So that's exactly what's going on with surfactant. Um, that's also kind of what's going on with uh, bile. When we talk about GI, bile kind of does something similar. So it increases like the surface area. It's an emulsifying type agent. Soap is an emulsifying agent. Like when you wash dishes, right? What do you use? You use detergent and soap to get rid of oils, right? So when you get rid of those oils with soap and detergent, you're basically allowing those oils to get bound up, right? So that's, they call that emulsification. Bile does basically the same thing with lipids. But we'll talk about that in a second. Um, other things in the respiratory physiology that you guys need to be familiar with. Let me see what else is going on here. Covered a lot of that. So what, uh, in terms of um, the type of receptors you find within your lungs, what are those receptors? Beta. Beta what? Beta one or two? Beta 2, right? So it's a good way to think about it. You have two lungs, right? So beta 2 receptors, that's going to be the adrenergic receptors in your lungs. What do those do at the levels of the bronchi or the bronchioles? Dilation. Good, exactly. So you get bronchial, bronchial dilation so that if you're exercising or you're running around, you have sympathetic activation at the level of the bronchioles. Because of that, you want to increase the amount of air and ventilation so that you get bronchial dilation. What drug does that as well? Anyone in here who has asthma should know that. Albuterol, good. So albuterol is going to bind to beta two receptors. Um, you also have beta two receptors on your heart as well. So uh, in terms of your heart, it's 
70% beta-1 receptors and about 30% beta-2 receptors. So if you take albuterol inhalers, you're also going to like consequently stimulate your heart as well. So you're going to, it's going to be kind of like a positive inotropic type effect, positive chron chronotropic effect. So you're going to have increased heart rate as a consequence. Can you share about the thermal aspiration and bacterial aspiration? Uh, don't no. I put that in there just so you can know what kind of, uh, things can, can result in pneumonia. So you can get viral pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia. Um, you can get, uh, chemical aspiration pneumonia. So that's, that's when you regurgitate and you accidentally inhale it. Right. And you can get hydrochloric acid down into your, into your lungs. You can also get bacteria inhaled into your lungs. A very common one is Klebsiella pneumoniae, but you guys are going to learn about that when you get into microbiology. So don't worry about that for now. Um, what about your alveolar pressures? What's, uh, what's your, so you have your intraalveolar pressure. What's the other pressure that's really important? Remember we talked about pneumothorax? What's going on with pneumothorax? You get the collapsed lung. You also have air just entering into that interpleural space. What should the interpleural space be in terms of pressure? Is the interalveolar and the interpulmonary that's the same thing? Uh, basically, yeah, okay. yeah. So interalveolar pressure versus the interpleural pressure. So interpleural pressure should be what? Should it be greater than or less than the out interalveolar pressure? Generally speaking, like if you're just kind of like at rest. Less. It should be less than. So it should be technically a vacuum in there, right? So it's kind of a vacuum. It's supposed to be kind of like a quote unquote, like a potential space. You're not really supposed to have anything in there except for what? There's fluids, right? Like serous fluid. You're supposed to have serous fluid in there to provide lubrication. So you can protect the lung parenchyma from friction while you're breathing. Um, when you're breathing in, what's your interpleural pressure going to be compared to your interalveolar pressure? Is it less than or greater than? It should still be less than. <laughs> it should still be less than because your intraalveolar pressure, when you're breathing in, you're supposed to be creating a vacuum kind of in your lung, right? So you can allow air to come in, right? So your intraalveolar interpleural pressure would be would be less than. Um, when you're breathing out, your interpleural pressure is going to increase a little bit, right? So you get an increase, but still in general, your interpleural pressure should be less than your interalveolar pressure. So pretty basic stuff with that. Okay, let's move on. Ah, the respiratory centers of the brain. Let's go over those because those are really fun. Um, let me go ahead and erase all this. Always clear all. What are the respiratory centers in the brain and where do you find them? The pons and the medulla, awesome. So let's draw those out. So here's my brain, it's very tiny. Let's draw the brainstem a little bit larger here. So we got midbrain, then we get pons, and then we get medulla down below that. And then we have the spinal cord coming off the medulla. So here's pons and medulla. And then this would be midbrain up on top, but we're not really focused on the midbrain uh, for the sake of the respiratory control centers. So where, what do you find within the medulla? You have a couple different regions. What's the one over here on the, in the back, the posterior portion? The what? Yeah, good. Dorsal something. <laughs> dorsal. So it's the DRG or the dorsal respiratory group. Good. All right. So we'll talk about the function of each of these in a second here. So that's the dorsal respiratory group. What's this guy over here in the front? So that's going to be the ventral respiratory group. And then sitting around the ventral respiratory group is something else. What's that called? Huh? I'm going to butcher the spelling here, but I 
free Botzinger complex. I think there's like a double O or something because it's probably German. <laughs> I'm not sure. But anyway, so that's the pre-Botzinger complex right over here. Okay. What's the pre-Botzinger complex do? It's the respiratory pacemaker. Okay. So that's going to set the pace of your respiration. And which, which does it control? Does it control the VRG or the DRG? It's going to control the DRG. Good. And what's the DRG going to be doing? When does it turn on? When does it turn off? So it turns on and it turns off. It's going to be turning on during inspiration. I'm just going to shorthand here. And it's going to turn off during expiration. So in other words, turns on, breathe in, turns off, and then just passively you exhale as a consequence when it turns off. Okay. So that being said, what's going on with the VRG? It's going to be forced expiration, right? So this is when you're exercising or you're running away from a lion. <laughs> um, so it's going to be turning on uh, during expiration. So you have the DRG turning on during inspiration and you're going to have forced expiration. So it's going to turn on during expiration. Cool. So that is uh, the DRG and VRG. What's going on up here on the top, on the pons? So you got two different centers. What's the first one on the very top? You guys remember? No, that's the that's the bottom one. Good, so pneumotaxic. Pardon my handwriting. <laughs> pneumotaxic, and then the other one is what? Starts with an A. Wait, what did you say? <laughs> I know my drawing kind of looks like that, but <laughs> happen new stick center, okay? <laughs> we're not at uh, reproduction yet. <laughs> That's going to be like the next section. So we're at the pneumotactic center is going to be on the top. Sorry, that was really funny. <laughs> pneumotactic on top, happen new stick center on the bottom. What's going on with the happen new stick center? What is that going to be doing? Prevents DRG. Good. So what does that do if it prevents the DRG from turning off? So it prevents this from happening. So it prevents the expiration, right? So what's going on over there? Really deep inhale. Yeah, so it's long inspirations. Long inspiration. What's going on with the pneumotaxic center? Yeah. Pneumotaxic center is going to increase the uh, the rate of the inspiration. So it's going to be short, rapid inspiration. It will kick in if you're in a situation where all of a sudden, like maybe you're uh, maybe you're hypercapnic, you have too much carbon dioxide, maybe you're acidotic, right? So all those different things. Speaking of chemical changes in the brain, what's going on with chemoreceptors? What are they going to be sensitive to? You have Central and peripheral chemoreceptors. What are the peripheral chemoreceptors responding to? Oxygen levels. Good. So they're both going to respond to carbon dioxide as well. So you get carbon dioxide on the peripheral. So, but for, let's, just for the sake of simplicity, oxygen for peripheral. So I'm going to just abbreviate peripheral chemoreceptors. So PCR. Oxygen levels as well as what? pH. Okay, they're both going to respond to pH levels. What's going on in the central chemoreceptors? So you have central chemoreceptors. CO2. Good, CO2 levels. They both relate to pH too, right? Yes, of course. Yeah, because as CO2 levels change, your pH levels are going to change as well. So in other words, increase CO2, decrease pH, and those are all going to have effects on these different regions in your brainstem. Cool. All right. Let me go to my cheat sheet here. It's going to uh, it's going to increase your respiratory rate. So it's going to make it rapid, rapid breathing. Okay. Short breaths. All right. So it's going to increase your respiratory rate. So DRG is relaxing and DRG is running. So like, 
Uh, yeah, DRG, you're just sitting here, quiet inspiration. VRG, you're like actively exercising. Um, and then the, I forgot to mention. So the app, I did mention this. Appanoustic Center controls the DRG, okay? That's it. That's it for respiratory. That's all you guys need to know. Okay, let's go into some of the GI uh, topics that you guys need to know with GI. Actually, is there anything else you guys had any questions on regarding respiration? No. The respiratory pacemaker is going to be the pre-Botzinger complex. That's going to be this guy over here. The pre-Botzinger complex sort of kind of hangs out in that ventral area. So it's going to be sort of near the ventral respiratory group. The pre-Botzinger complex, however, is going to regulate the DRG. So if you if you have an increased demand for, for breathing, right, then it's going to set the pace of the DRG. So the DRG starts going a little bit more rapid. If you don't really need that, it'll maybe slow it down a little bit. Um, but that's going to be the ultimate respiratory pacemaker, the pre-Botzinger complex. All right. Um, what is going on with uh, the GI tract? So with the GI tract, what happens when you put food in your mouth? What's that phase called? So there's, there's the, the three different phases that I was talking about. Right. So you got the buccal phase. Right. What's going on with the buccal phase? So you're like, you're chewing, you're masticating, right? And then all of a sudden you're about to swallow, right? Well, the mastication part is the more voluntary part. Once you get into the buccal phase, then it starts becoming more involuntary, right? So that means food is starting to get pushed against your uh, soft palate, right? And so that's going to be the buccal phase right before it gets into uh, the pharynx. And right, once you get into the pharyn pharynx, that's going to be the what? Pharyngeal phase. What's happening at the pharyngeal phase? Yeah, so it's not all degl deglutition. But with the pharyngeal phase, what's going on with the larynx? It, it, it elevates, closing the epiglottis, right? Then food can go down into the esophagus, right? And then now you enter into the esophageal phase. Good. Um, in terms of the esophagus, what's the main main cranial nerve that's responsible for? It? Yeah, so ten, and you have a um, accessory. Sorry, uh, cranial nerve nine is also going to be involved as well too, not the accessory. Huh? So nine and ten are going to be involved in uh, esophagus. What's up? Are you going to join us? <laughs> we feed all animals. <laughs> You're not talking about me, are you? <laughs> I didn't realize. I'm you. It's uh it's a female dominant field. It's because females are more caring than us, guys. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> Speak for yourself, sir. <laughs> Okay, so what's going on when you're chewing? What's happening with uh, salivation? What's uh, what's the main, what are the three glands that are involved in salivation? Broded glands, submandibular gland, sublingual gland, which is the one that's the most important? Submandibular, okay. So so in terms of in level of importance, it would be submandibular gland is number one. Number two would be parotid gland. Number three would be sublingual gland. Now, in terms of the ducts, what are the different ducts associated with each? What's the duct associated with the first important one? The submandibular gland. So it's with the W, Wharton's gland. Yeah, so Wharton's gland is the number one. Where do you find that? It's like kind of a J. So if you lift your tongue, you look at your frenulum, right? The frenulum, it's directly adjacent to the frenulum. Okay. You need another percentage too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you know the the most important ones, so like 70% would be submandibular, a uh, smaller percent would be uh, parotid, and then an even smaller percent would be sublingual. 
What's the gland associated with the parotid gland? Not gland, I'm sorry, the uh, duct. Stetton's duct, good. You find that on your second, second molar tooth, right? That's gonna be in your maxilla. So it's gonna be upper jaw. What about um, sublingual? What's the name of that duct? Yeah, Ravinus's duct. Good, good, good. And you have a couple different types of cells that are going to be found in your glands. So what's the one that produces amylase? Huh? Serous glands. What about mucus? Yeah, so you have like mucus cells that produce different types of mucins. So pretty straightforward stuff. So that's uh, that's going to be all the buccal phase, right? So mastication, chewing, releasing all the different, uh, no, it's releasing saliva plus the different types of digestive enzymes um, that initiate digestion while you're chewing. So amylase, what's amylase breaking down? Carbohydrates, good. What about lipase? What's that breaking down? Lipids, good. Um, cool, so now let's get down to the esophagus. What is that term for when you have irritation of your esophagus due to um, acids coming back, GERD, which stands for gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD. Um, what happens with long-standing GERD if left untreated? You start getting some metaplastic events taking place. What is metaplasia? The changing of the cell types. Yeah, so you're changing those cells. They're, the mucosal cells start getting irritated because of the presence of hydrochloric acid. And then over time, those cells start becoming so irritated, they start changing, right? So they start evolving into different cell types. So that's metaplasia. What's that called? Something esophagus. Starts with a B. Barrett's esophagus, good. What happens if you have long-standing Barrett's esophagus? What happens after that? You might get what? You might get what type of cancer? Cool, good, excellent, straightforward stuff. Nothing too crazy. Can you know about peristalsis? Sure, yeah, what's going on with peristalsis? What kind of muscles are involved in peristalsis? Number one demographic, uh, I would say smokers, uh, men, alcoholics, people that like spicy food, people with hiatal hernias. Okay, I got one of those, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, my... Uh, It's extremely common. It's a high profit margin. What kind of phagia? This phagia. That's all. That's all it takes, huh? <laughs> all right. So we got some. Got some good information from the peanut gallery over there. <laughs> so what's going on? Uh, let's see, we got peristalsis. What's happening with peristalsis? Is that voluntary? No, it's involuntary. What kind of muscles? Good, smooth muscles. Are they striated? No, good, they're smooth. <laughs> uh, what's the other thing? This peristalsis, what's the other thing? Good, what's going on with segmentation? Is it, does it happen? Like consent, like pretty regularly, or what's happening with that? It's random, yeah. What's the point of segmentation? It it's breaking things down to like smaller parts so you can increase surface area and maximize absorption. And you're gonna get that throughout the GI tract. Um, what are the two major muscles that are involved in peristalsis? Yeah, good, good. So you have like circular and longitudinal muscles. What's going on with the longitudinal muscles? What are they doing? Mm 
Are they changing the length of the GI? Yeah, so they change they shorten the length of the GI, so it kind of helps to like you know propel things further down the GI tract. Um, okay, so that's those are the muscles. Those are that's peristalsis segmentation. Um, let's talk about let's talk about the stomach now. Okay, so what's going on at the level of the stomach? What are the three major cell types that were pretty important that we covered yesterday? Do you guys remember? What's what's gastrin released by? G cells. Good, cool. So you got G cells that release gastrin. What does gastrin do? Does it go like? Does it just hang out in the stomach, or does it go somewhere else? Yeah, good. It goes into the bloodstream. What does gastrin ultimately do? It's going to stimulate what? It does stimulate, yes. It can, yes. And what else does it do? Think about movement. What is it doing to the stomach? Is it going to increase or decrease gut motility? Good. It's going to increase gut motility. So in terms of acid, let's talk about that. What's the major cell type that releases acid? So we talked about G cells, gastrin, HCL, parietal cells. Good. Parietal cells release HCL and, which is what? Intrinsic factor. Good. What does intrinsic factor do? Good. It allows for the absorption of vitamin B12. Where does vitamin B12 get absorbed? You have an option of either the duodenum, the jejunum, or the ileum. Did you say duodenum? <laughs> <laughs> the ileum. Vitamin B12 gets... <laughs> Not the rectum. <laughs> vitamin B12 gets absorbed in the ileum. Cool. What happens if you don't have intrinsic factor? If you can't produce intrinsic factor for whatever reason? What's that condition called? Pernicious anemia. Yeah, we went over all that yesterday. Yes, sir. <laughs> Pernicious anemia. Okay. So pernicious anemia. How do, you fix that? How do you fix it? You can give the patient intrinsic factor. So you pernicious. You know what the word pernicious means? Deadly. Deadly anemia. So that's uh, intrinsic factor. So that's going to be your parietal cells. So parietal cells release hydrochloric acid. Speaking of hydrochloric acid, what does hydrochloric acid help? convert we're not there yet we'll talk about that in a second what's going on with hydrochloric acid what's another cell type that's inside your inside your stomach uh-huh yeah exactly yeah exactly so what's the protein what's that what's that cell type that breaks down proteins what's that chemical that breaks down the proteins you have protease, but then there's one that, that's released from your stomach. Pepsin, pepsinogen, which is released by what type of cell? Chief cells, good, chief cells. So chief cells are gonna release pepsinogen, which is the inactive form of pepsin. How does pepsin get activated? Hydrochloric acid, excellent. So hydrochloric acid. And then um, what's, the other, uh, what's the other chemical released by uh, chief cells? Gastric lipase, awesome. So you have you have a chemical that breaks down proteins and you have another one that breaks down lipids. So gastric lipase. So that's what's going on at the stage, um, at the level of the stomach. Um, let's talk about what's going on in the different phases of uh, gastric secretion. What's the first phase of gastric secretion? What happens when you're like, think you're really hungry, all of a sudden you start smelling food, you start thinking of a really nice, delicious meal, like the menudo that I showed you guys the other day. You guys had menudo, right? Some of you. You don't like menudo? Why not? <laughs> the texture, it throws you off. <laughs> it's kind of rubbery and chewy, right? Yeah. 
You learn to love it. You don't like pasole? <laughs> you know what pasole used to originally be made out of? People. Pasole was originally made out of people. So yeah, people that used to get uh, ritually sacrificed. Uh, I think it was either Mayan. Was it Mayan or Aztec? It was either Mayan or Aztec. I can't remember. But when the Spanish conquistadors came over, they're like, you need to stop eating humans. So then like the the folks that were eating human pasole started using pork instead. So <laughs> anyways, uh, that was a total digression. I would imagine that menudo might have been also made out of like human stomach too. <laughs> Uh, yeah, don't really worry about D cells so much, but somatostatin is going to be what the D cells are going to be responsible for. So nothing really too crazy there, but I'm not testing you guys on D cells, but it's good that you know what you know, D cells are and what they do. So let's talk about the cephalic phase, right? Oh, shoot. I just gave it to you guys. So that was the cephalic phase, right? You're thinking about menudo, you're thinking about pasole, and all of a sudden you start getting stimulation of the cephalic phase, right? So you start prepping your stomach. What's like some of the things that get released? Oh, ghrelin. Yeah, ghrelin. That's going to be, you know, your stomach goes grr, right? So that's when you're hungry. So ghrelin, that's going to be helping you to stimulate uh, hunger. What's uh, What are some of those things that get released? Remember we talked about some of the cell types. We talked about G cells. What gets released from G cells? Gastrin. Good. So gastrin starts to get released during that cephalic phase. Basically what's happening, you're priming the stomach to receive a meal at the cephalic phase, uh, phase. What happens when now you do eat something? You go into what phase? The gastric phase, awesome. So what's happening with the gastric phase? Yeah, good. So you get chemoreceptors, uh, mechanoreceptors that uh, just due to the, the stretch from like the food contents that enter into your stomach, those are all going to help to also further release gastrin you also get the release of things like histamine as well. Um, and then what happens when uh, the food is getting, you know, finishing up its mechanical and chemical digestion in the stomach and it starts leaving and moving further down the GI tract? What's happening next? Good, the intestinal phase. What's happening with the intestinal phase? What's the first level of the small intestine, the first uh, section of the small intestine? Duodenum. What's going on at the level of duodenum? Uh, you're going to get a couple of things that are released at the duodenum. So do you guys remember uh, cholecystokinin, CCK? Okay, cholecystokinin. You also get secretin release. Secretin is going to help to allow for like pancreatic enzymes to start being released as well. So that's going to be the intestinal phase. So. Let's see what's important here. Uh, what's going on in the, what's going on at the cellular level in the intestines? So you have, what's what's the thing that increases surface area in the intestines? You got villi, right? And then you have microvilli. Microvilli are gonna be associated with the individual cells, right? So they're gonna be like little tiny projections of the membrane out Right, so that also helps to further increase the uh, surface area. Um, what else do you find, especially around like the duodenal area? Yeah, brush border, <laughs> brush border enzymes. Cool, what are the some of the brush border enzymes? Lactase. Maltase, what's the other one? Sucrase, awesome, cool. What uh, do those enzymes do? It breaks down each of those uh, different types of molecules, right? So sucrose. So you guys need to know what sucrose, maltose, and um, lactose all turn into. Okay, we haven't gone over it yet, but... Let's go over it now. So in terms of, uh, let's start with maltose. So maltose turns into two individual sugars. So two individual glucose, right? Because the disaccharide, when it turns, when it gets converted from a disaccharide into a monosaccharide, it's going to turn into two individual glucose molecules, okay? 
one way that I try to remember that is maltose. I think of malt liquor. And what makes uh, malt liquors is the breakdown of sugar from the fermentation process. So I just think of it as being like two glucoses that are broken down from maltose. That's kind of the way I think about it. Um, sucrose, that's broken down by sucrase, uh, that's going to also involve a glucose molecule. Let's also involve a fructose molecule as well. And then um, lactose uh, breaks down into also glucose. And then the other one is going to be galactose. Is it maltose, lactose, and uh, There's maltose, lactose, and sucrose. Sucrose is going to break down into a glucose and a fructose molecule or monosaccharide. Okay, so that's that's what the brush border enzymes are going to help do. Do the brush border enzymes get released? Right, there you have there's contact, right? You have to have direct contact in order for those enzymes to actually uh, be able to function properly. So they don't get released; they remain at the level of the brush border. And then, uh, what would happen if you were deficient in any of those enzymes? Yeah, intolerance. You wouldn't be able to process those uh, disaccharides. So a great example would be lactose, lactose intolerance. You wouldn't be able to break down lactose into its uh, monomers or monosaccharides. Um, leptin, what about leptin? Tell me where it comes from. Yeah, so adipocytes, right? And what does leptin do? So ghrelin is what? Ghrelin is where your stomach goes grr and you're hungry. Leptin is going to be the opposite. Right? So leptin is going to be uh, released from your adipocytes to signal that you've basically eaten enough. You don't need to eat anymore. So in other words, it's a, it's a satiety uh, molecule, satiety chemical or hormone. Okay, so we went over so much of this already. So let's see here. That basically kind of covers everything we've gotten up to so far. Do you guys have any specific questions that we can go into? No? No? I just need an overview. You just need to overview everything? Um, yeah, so we covered the majority of the GI. So we haven't really talked about this yet, but let's just kind of go over it. So you have uh, mechanical and chemical digestion taking place at the level of the stomach. Right. As soon as food now enters into the duodenum and into the small intestines, what's going on in the small intestines? What's all what's like the purpose of the small intestines? Yeah, that's where the bulk of all of the absorption takes place, right? The absorption of nutrients. What's like the percentage? About 90%. Good. Um, and then uh, what's going on in the large intestines? We haven't gotten there yet, but in and out of your body. Right. So you're basically trying to remove as much of something out of, at that point, it's feces. We were trying to remove something out of, out of the fecal matter. That's really important. Fecal water. water, yeah, exactly. So uh, the large intestines are gonna be responsible for the bulk of the reabsorption of water. So it goes from chyme, stomach, small intestines, down into your large intestines. That's where it becomes fecal matter. And then that's fecal matter. I think it's about 70% of it is, is made up of water. So you're trying to extract as much water as possible. If you can't get the water out, what happens? Hmm? If you can't get the water out of your fecal matter, what happens? <laughs> Diarrhea, right? <laughs> if you're dehydrated, you don't have enough water, what's going on? Constipation, good. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, what else do you find within your large intestines that's really important? You guys familiar with microflora, your, your microbiota? So you have lots of different bacteria within your large intestines that are gonna serve various purposes, some of which are to help uh, you know, break down uh, different kinds of molecules so you can absorb vitamins and nutrients, fat-soluble vi vitamins, for, for example, um, vitamin K, for example. We're gonna talk about all that stuff uh, next time we meet. So know that you have a lot of uh, your gut microbiome, a lot of it's going to be found within your large intestines. You have tons. Um, some of our, and a lot of them are 
uh, could be potentially pathogenic, right? So like E. coli, for example, is one example. Uh, e. coli is an important part of your GI tract, but it could become pathogenic if you uh, get it in the wrong places. Um, for instance, like UTIs, that's the number one cause of UTIs. Um, also in terms of uh, cholecystitis or inflammation of your gallbladder, in terms of bacterial infections, the number one bacteria is E. coli that causes cholecystitis. Cool. That kind of covers a lot of your GI tract, everything that you guys need to know. You guys have any other questions? What about the lactules? Where are those located? Those are going to be within your uh, small intestines. And what do the lacteals do again? Huh? Mm -hmm. Lymph. Lipids. That's going to be lipid absorption. That's what the lacteals do. And speaking of lacteals, what are the four different levels of your GI tract, starting with the mucosa? What are the other levels or layers? Good. Muscularis and then serosa. Good. What's going on at the mucosa? Right, good. And what are you finding within the mucosa? You find uh, the epithelium, but you also find something else that's like kind of connective tissue. Huh? Yeah, the lamina propria is going to be found within the mucosa. Um, what about the submucosa? What do you find in there? Oh, yes. Sorry. Speaking of lamina propria, it's connected tissues, but you're also going to find a couple of different structures that are important. So what are some of those structures? Vessels. Yeah, blood vessels, right? Because you're going to get absorption of nutrients, right? So you need lots of vascularization within the level of the lamina propria and the submucosa, or sorry, within the mucosa so that you can absorb nutrients. Um, you also have like the lacteals, as you were mentioning. Those are going to be found within that layer, the lamina propria. Um, in terms of the submucosa, so you have two different uh, plexuses. <laughs> I don't know what the plural term for that is, but you have uh, a bunch of neurons within uh, the submucosa and another one within the muscularis. What's the one that you find within the submucosa? Meisner's, good. Meisner's, those are, that's the submucosal uh, plexus. And then what do you, uh, which one do you find within the muscularis? Our box, which is also referred to as what? Myenteric. What, is, what are the Meisner's uh, nerves doing? What's the Meisner's plexus doing? No, that's the other one actually. So Meisner's plexus, that's gonna be in the submucosa. So it's pretty close to where you find all those blood vessels, right, within that lamina propria area. So it's going to help to regulate the diameter of those blood vessels, right? So if you're in your parasympathetic state of rest and digest, those blood vessels are all going to dilate. So you can allow for maximum absorption of nutrients. So the Meisner's plexus will help to moderate that function. And then the Auerbach's plexus, that was the other one that you said was peristalsis. So it's going to help to innervate those uh, different types of uh, smooth muscle, those circular as well as those longitudinal muscles uh, within the muscularis. That is, that's all I have for you guys. You guys have any other questions? How many of you guys are actually outside there in the hallway? Quite a few of you. Is it more than within the room? Maybe during the next review session, I'll try to find like a bigger room for us to do this in, so. <laughs> Um, if you guys have any other questions, just shoot me an email. We'll be wrapping up uh, chapter 25 on Tuesday. The rest of it is actually pretty straightforward. Part two is the, I think, the most, uh, the more challenging one where you have to know all the different cell types and all what the cells secrete. So you'll, if you guys understand chapter uh, 25, part two, you should be pretty good. Thanks for joining, guys. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure.